Take two. Hello, <laughs> we're here. We're here at the Elliott Hotel. March 27th, it's around 11.45 in the morning. I'm here with Henry Alex Rubin, director of Disconnect. Hello, Henry. Hi. You said during your lecture last night, you had questions for your audience. Ask away. Uh, well, you know, I haven't shown the movie to many people, and so it's a, uh, it's a real uh, eye-opener for me to sit with the film and to get reactions from my audience members. And, you know, I think when you make a movie or you make anything, you, you want to interact with uh, the public. That's why you make things. And so uh, uh, one, of the, you know, one of the great delights is to, to have conversations and to get reactions. There was no trailer that I saw before the movie because it's not out yet. And it was great to see it in advance. So I, I sit down in the theater and there's a collage of images. I, I felt that the movie started intentionally out of focus. And as, you, as it gains steam, you start seeing that it's an anthology of stories that are all interconnected. And then after the first 20 minutes, after I got the characters in place and realized what was going on, then it really became um, a whodunit. Yes, it's a thriller. I mean, it's three intertwining stories, but it is, this movie is a thriller, and I, I, I like it when people tell me that it's moving, uh, because that's what I tried very hard to do, was to, to trail and, uh, the emotions of all the characters and uh, create a, a climax that, that was more about emotional violence than, than violence. You started with documentaries. I did. And, and could you name some of them? Um, I made a, a movie called Who is Henry Jaglum, which is about the cult director Henry Jaglum. I produced a movie called Freestyle, which is about the art of freestyling. And uh, I made a movie with my partner Dana about uh, quadriplegics who play rugby in wheelchairs called Murderball. So with that background, uh, it seemed, and, and I watched the lecture last night, we taped some of the lecture, and that you made this fictional movie, but almost in a documentary style, or in a documentary style. Yes, well that was uh, more because I didn't, more as a, as a um, function of the fact that I didn't know how to make a fiction film, rather than a choice. Uh, because I come from documentaries, that's all I know how to do. Um, I even, you know, I, I shoot commercials, and even my commercials are all shot in documentary style. Um, that's what I learned, and uh, that's all I know. Um, I didn't go to, you know, film school, and I get, didn't get taught how to do the classic shot, reverse shot, master, even though I know what that is. So, I don't like continuity problems, I don't like relighting, so all I did was, just as in a documentary, set up two cameras, light everything, and let the actors go. So that means they can move anywhere they want, it means they can say whatever they want, they can improvise, they can overlap their dialogue, and I still can cut the scene together. Can we talk a little bit more about the technical aspect, and then we're going to get back to the, to the movie itself and, and reviewing it, kind of, sort of. Uh, what did you shoot in all? This coffee's delicious. It's not bad. Yeah? What do you, it's like a vanilla bean. I don't know. Yeah. It's good to be here, though. It is. The Elliott Hotel is nice. I um, understand you usually just do a late show, and this is very early for you. Yeah, we only go on location for special people, and you're special. Oh, thank you. <laughs> no, Cheers. you are. It was a good movie. Cheers. Uh, thank you for coming to, to location. Um, so it, excuse it's, me while I disconnect my phone. It's a lot of fun to go into a, a TV studio and, you know, just sit there and, and do the... We're, we're live on, on Thursday nights, so we take... You know, our, our movie critic calls in from Texas, and we did a whole series on Hitchcock movies. Exciting. So the, the show isn't about movies, but we like talking movies, so it's great to be here with you. Um, what did you shoot it on? I shot these on, uh, on the Epic, which is the new RED camera, and that's digital format, but I used very old lenses from the 1960s. And was that from your documentary background, or was that because of this movie you wanted to have the old lenses? Well, I, I don't like the way that uh, digital looks very uh, clean and uh, sharp. I, I like the softness of the older lenses and the older documentary films. I also love zoom lenses because you don't have to stick to one size frame. You can you know go in and out. There's a lot of, m mostly, 
zoom lenses used in this film. That and doesn't mean that that doesn't mean it's always zooming. It just means that you can slowly zoom in and slowly creep in and out of things that you want to look at. It's very helpful, which I which you know it's is one of the best things to do in a documentary is that you can go from a wide to a tight very quickly by just snap zooming in and then you cut out the zoom so that people just see a wide and then they see a tight and they don't see the zoom in between. It worked because it, it felt like a film. It felt like it was done on film. So it had that, it didn't glare at you. Yeah. So that worked. And, and the, the story too, it was a very, there's a lot of warmth despite a lot of the conflict, be, be it the family conflicts or the conflict of the journalist and having some kind of um, maybe pangs of guilt. Um, so a lot of different emotions flowing around. Um, then we get to the whole aspect of cybercrime. And you have the, the FBI on a national level, and you have the local law enforcement on a small level, and they both seem unable to get it together or even work together. Well, you know, this is a, a, a this is so new cybercrime that we are still passing legislation about it, and most cities don't even have a cybercrime unit. Only major cities. Um, the law enforcement has been overwhelmed by cybercrime in the past ten years, and um, you know, when it comes to identity theft, this is something that's reported. Uh, you know. Some upwards of twenty thousand times a day, a uh, day, a day, and uh, and so it, you know it's, it's it's the simply law enforcement certainly local law enforcement has no has no resources to combat this, and uh, and and so it, it falls on the banks and their investigators to combat this, and they don't have the resources either, and when it's uh, and and so depending on the amount of money, um, you know there are priorities on who who's. Uh, uh, whose cases to investigate. If you're like this couple in this film, if you're sort of in, at the in-between or on the lower end of the spectrum, um, you could be waiting for months before your case gets resolved. And in those months, if you don't have any money, you, uh, I've met many people who have been really, you know, uh, in dire straits after having lost their identity. Um, that said, you know, the, 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 that story is, is pulled right out of the headlines. And more and more people are getting their identity stolen, and, and Andrew Stern, who wrote the script, um, you know, thought that he he'd found three different stories um, that really w were a consequence of the modern technology that we use daily. Um, thematically, the movie is all about you know humans trying to communicate. If anything, I would say it's about the power of human relationships, you know, and and how they can overcome. Um, miscommunications, um, but the, the the story is all three of the plots are pulled right out of the headlines. There was that bullying case of the woman on MySpace and the girl committed suicide. Um, would, was that the story that Andrew pulled from? It uh, there wasn't that one specifically. There have been others, and uh, he, you know the one that he I forget the one that he pulled from something that had happened in Texas possibly. I'll have to ask him again. But uh, you know, the, the, there have been so many examples of uh, people having false profiles and creating false identities um, to, to either uh, you know, create boyfriends or girlfriends or even just taunt people online um, that it's, it's pretty easy to find a story that, uh, to base our story on. Um, again, there's, you know, there's uh, two other stories in the film. One is about a couple that loses their identity and go vigilante to try to get their money back. And the other story is about a journalist who wants to do a story on, a, on, a, on an underage uh, sex performer who she, who she finds online and her inappropriate relationship that develops out of it. And of course, the, uh, the, the drama in that story comes when the FBI see her story and want the information about where this kid is and she promised to keep it uh, safe and promised to protect the kid. So she's, she's torn between whether or not to lose her job and tell the FBI all, everything she knows or to protect the kid. She didn't do a Judith Miller in uh, Jude of the New York Times. Remember, Judith went to jail. Yes, instead. Judith went to jail. And I mean, this is a big issue that you know journalists are facing: is, is how far do you protect your sources? So that's one of the themes that this movie explores. I represented Judith's brother for many years. Did you know her brother was Jimmy Miller, the Rolling Stones producer? 
I didn't. The guy who produced Brown Sugar, Gimme Shelter. Amazing individual. I yeah. didn't know, but what a family. Yeah, so Judith Miller is the uh, half-sister. I guess she was Bill Miller's daughter, and Jimmy is Bill Miller's son. So I just thought I'd throw that little aside in. Uh, it's fascinating. Your script writer, do you sit down with him and look at the script? Do you work by email? How does it work? We sat down many times. Uh, he, you know, he'd written a really brilliant script. Uh, you know, I all I did was research it further. So uh, as I said last night, I found a lot of real people. I interviewed a lot of real people, real cybercrime detectives, real FBI agents, real uh, underage child uh, porn performers, uh, real cyber bullies, and that reinformed the script and it just refined it and added more detail into Andrew's already very strong, sort of very compelling script. You know, he had laid it all out. Um, and I just made it more real. The internet's just one big glob of information. Was this movie kind of reflecting that, you know, you have to sift through, disconnect, you have to sift through all of the, you know, the TMI coming at you. I almost felt like it was a real life version of The Matrix, of people plugging in and just kind of leaving the real world to be in this uh, fantasy, if you will. Yeah, I mean, you know, we all, we all, mostly the internet and technology is incredibly useful and connects us all. It is uh, the most exciting thing to me that, you know, since electricity, though I wasn't around when that was invented. So I, I absolutely love technology and I'm myself slightly addicted to my phone as many of my friends are as well. Um, you know, I certainly didn't set out to make a movie that was anti-technology or that was preaching uh, anything. It's just these are three stories that, that were right, you know, right out of the headlines and I just wanted to make them all as realistic as possible. It does bring up questions, the movie, like how much should you be on your phone? How much should you, time should you spend with your family? How much should your kids be on the iPad? Um, these are all questions I think all of us are trying to figure out personally. Uh, you know, I, I've heard stories of couples who don't want technology in the bedroom. I've, uh, I've, I've some friends with which I play a game where we put our phones in the middle of the table and the, pers the first person to answer the phone has to pay for the meal. So I think all, it, all of us individually are trying to figure out a relationship to uh, our devices. But I feel like that that is just one of the questions that comes out of the film. The film is not about that. You know Grand Funk Railroad, remember them? Yes. Mark Foner. Uh, yeah, he's been on the show a couple of times and, and he said that he disconnects the cable. He didn't want his kids, now his kids are adult, but when they were growing up, this is from an interview 10 years ago, he said he didn't want them watching all the commercials. And he just wanted to keep them away from all that junk and, and I don't disagree with him. Yeah. It's a little, commercials to me, you're always hitting the mute button. Yeah. Because there's like some law where the commercials can't be louder anymore and they still are. Yeah. So it's, um, disconnect is more than just the cell phone, it's the TV too. Yes, I mean now there are commercials on the internet, you know. Yeah. So you can't avoid them. And they pop up. They do. They pop uh, up. The family life in the, in the film, you've got these strong parents. Mm -hmm. And kids are going to do what kids are going to do. And when they go into school, you've got the loner, and you've got the, the peer bonding where these, these guys, if they weren't together, they wouldn't be getting into trouble. So it's maybe less of not having that good environment because they came from good environments. Um, they were fed. They had a roof over their head. They didn't have to go into these directions. So this is just ordinary people going kind of, oh, I can get away with this, so I'm going to do it. I don't know. That's just what I got from it. I mean, I think the tendency to uh, look for a laugh is something that's very human. Cyberbullying that is, or bullying in general, is, bullying is been in existence since forever, I'm pretty sure. Um, and it starts with you just want to look for a laugh. And sometimes the laugh is at someone else's expense. You know, um, I, in, in terms of that storyline, I tried to make it as natural as possible. I let those actors really improvise and get to know each other, those two guys. And I, I filmed them just like I was, I was describing before, from far away, with long lenses. And I would never cut so that I would just tell them to go again, or try this, or try that, so that they would feel uh, very unfettered by the, by the cameras, and, and by the microphones, and by, the, by the, uh, the crew, and they could just feel free to just be themselves, you know? And that was important to me, because 
people who are bullies are not uh, often, they're not, uh, you know, born as, as, as evil or criminal or, 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 you know, or jerks even, you know, they're, they're, the ones I met were normal, sweet, goofy kids looking for a laugh. And that's important to, to show the truth of who these, these kids are that, that, that can do this. I think we've all done it at one point. We've all made a joke at the expense of someone else at some point in our lives or had that happen to us. So it's, it's something that's very natural. It's, it's all around us and I wanted to try to capture that as realistically as possible. Now these two young actors, did they ever approach you and say, wow, I had no idea this would have this effect on someone? As they were in character and then they came out of character, did, they, did it affect them in any way? As individuals outside I mean, I, the movie, <coughs> I mean, they those the, Colin Ford and Aviad Bernstein, who plays the two young kids in the movie, um, you know, they definitely related to this, and they've had friends, and they've had um, friends in their lives experience bullying, and you know, so it wasn't alien to them. But I, I, it was very important for me that they they say their language and the words in their own in their own way, and not uh, have to stick to a script, um, because you know I just wanted to capture truth and and, 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 and authenticity between these kids. Um, the you know in answer to your question, I don't think either of those kids have ever bullied anyone. They're both way too sweet for that, uh, but I know that they've been around that behavior. Uh, like I said before, I think we all have been around that. You know, oh, I wasn't, even, accu I wasn't even accusing them. I was just wondering if it just like blew them away just to experience that kind of, um, that kind of, you know, uh, it's David versus Goliath in a whole other way because but the traditional bullying is the big guy that kicks the sand in the feet is on the face of the skinny guy. But now with technology, you get people who, if they want to bully, they're still seeking out weaker prey. Ah, there's 12 of us, and we can gang up on one of him, on one of her. And so it's a, it's a whole new bullying, but they still seem to be seek, seeking out someone who might not fight back. And, you know, this kid didn't fight back. He just imploded. Well, he didn't fight back because he didn't, he didn't, he thought that he was talking to a real person. Uh, there was nothing, to, no one to fight back. I mean, even when the, I mean, you know, I don't want to give away what right. happens, but, uh, you know, he was just, he believed, he believed, you know, it's very easy to believe that you're talking to someone real if, if everything seems authentic. You know, it happened to Manti Teo, and he's a, you know, he's a pretty sophisticated person. He believed he had a girlfriend on Facebook. I know, but one would think in this day and age that you go beyond. Someone just added themselves to my Facebook, and I, and I said to a friend of mine, "Hey, do you know who this person? Because you're friends with them too." And I'm a little nervous, you know. And, and um, it's a woman, and it's interesting. I just think they want to like follow me and be anonymous. But I picked up on that right away, and I'm going to probably disconnect that person in the next 48 hours if I don't get a solid answer. So y you have to be somewhat savvy that there are people out there that are just you know jerks. I don't know. I know you made this as a thriller, and you maybe don't want to get preachy because I was there at the Q and A last night. But in a way, it's almost like martial arts. It's a film version of martial arts where you're using the strength of the opponent against the opponent. Where the uh, the bad aspect of the internet is the uh, oh, it's the hammer that you drop maybe subconsciously or inadvertently, but it's there. Yeah, I mean. The, the the movie is, you know, about, thematically, I think, it's about people who are just having trouble communicating with each other. And the word disconnect has two meanings. One is to take something and unplug it. And the other thing is when two people are alienate, are alienated, you know? And I think it's that second meaning that the writer was more interested in. You know, if I were to say something, and you didn't understand it, we'd be alienated from each other. Or if I said something and you were offended and I didn't mean it that way, that's another disconnect. Um, I think that that, you know, is much more interesting, the disconnection between humans, whether the technology is involved or not, um, as a theme. And I think that's what he was going after. You know, um, in, dr in drug language, people go and seek their connection. 
it's funny the movie Disconnect about people who are into the internet. There are people who don't go on the web and they depend on someone like me to be their connection. I have a good friend, we go to dinner, I bring the laptop, we're on it together so that he can get his email out and whatever, but there's some people that just avoid the internet. They will use it to, to contact friends and, and have someone else do the, do the stuff with them, but it's really funny that there's a whole cult of people out there who don't want to be plugged in. But I'm the connection to a good friend who, you know. Mm. So there are good purposes for the internet. And people smart enough to just, I don't want any part of it. Like I said, I am very pro-technology. This is not an anti-internet movie um, at all. It just happens to take three, you know, if you want to make a thriller, you need something dramatic. It happens to take three movies that have to do with characters who are dealing with contemporary issues and, te and technology in their lives. But, uh, you know, th the internet is a very exciting place and it mostly connects us. Um, it, it's, it's just uh, in these three cases, in these three little thrillers, there are things that unravel that you know have to do with technology and the way in which people are communicating or not communicating with each other. You know, I was just throwing that out there, but the, the chemistry between all the actors was very good. Everyone seemed to connect perfectly on screen um, between the male hustler and the reporter, and even Jason Bateman and uh, Grillo. They all seem to have that kind of sizzling. You've got really good uh, performances out of all of them that worked. Thank you. I mean, I think my my uh, hey, I think my uh, um, should I start over. Cause no, that was our director. But oh, sorry. Okay, I'm being funny. Ooh, ooh, oh, our director. Yeah, we have to wrap up. Okay. So um, our final um, question is. I was oh about the performances. Thank you. Yeah, um, you did a great job with them, uh, thank and they you. did a great job with you. I, you know, all I can say is that what I learned making this movie, as, you know, as I said, it was my first fiction film, was that you really have to trust the actors. You really have to, um, you know, I, I learned a lot about uh, doing, you know, as little directing as possible and as much allowing as, as possible, you know? Yeah, to wrap up, you know, the, the male hustler had the power over the reporter. The reporter was frazzled with the FBI and kind of, uh, the FBI was so cold and aloof and it all kind of worked. Uh, you really, once you get focused 10 minutes into the movie, it is a roller coaster ride. And, and I loved how you got the three stories and they all interconnect. It was like reading an anthology where it's three separate stories, but they're all connected, and I really like that. So thank you very much for doing a great job. Thanks for, thanks for having me on your show. Thanks, Britt. And could you say for us your name on Visual Radio? Yes. My name is Henry Alex Rubin. On? On Visual Radio. Thank you. Well, what you would you like me to say the whole thing again? Yeah, I'm Henry. Well, sure, I'm, I'm I'm Henry Alex Rubin on Visual Radio. You've been visualized. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Great to meet you. Same here.